We are live. Great. Welcome to the DC Shorts Film Salon for a panel discussion on the topic, film schools, views, and variations. I'm Peter Morgan, the DC Shorts Executive Director. Thank you for joining us. This online film salon event is a collaboration between DC Shorts and the Goethe Institute and is the first in a series of four film salons in 2021. Next film salon will be in late May with the tentative topic, careers in the film industry, with the subheader, how did they get that job? Um, which will dovetail nicely with the many gra graduating students here in DC in May and June. This evening, we have an amazing panel who will, who will be introduced momentarily by the film salon moderators, Pam Nash, who is a filmmaker and DC Shorts board member, and Raleigh Joyner, cultural programmer at the Goethe Institute. But first, we have two save the dates. DC Shorts is planning our annual summer comedy short showcase in June called DC Shorts Laughs. The exact dates and films will be announced very soon. Plus the DC Shorts International Film Festival is set for September 9th through the 19th. So please save the dates. And finally, before we move on to the film salon, I'd like to thank one of our major funders, the DC Commission on Arts and Humanities here in DC. I'd also like to thank the Goethe Institute and especially Riley for partnering with us once again. And thank you to the amazing panel who will now be introduced by Pam and Riley. Take it away, Pam. Uh, I thought Raleigh was gonna introduce the panel. <laughs> You're muted. Raleigh, you're muted. Sorry. All right. I should go ahead and say, first of all, thank you so much to everybody who has joined us from both sides of the Atlantic uh, for this panel. Um, we have really been very fortunate as DC Shorts and Goethe to be able to bring together this panel of seven really wonderful people who can speak to us from their experiences as it regards film studies, film programs, film schools um, in Germany and the United States. Um, a little bit of background just sort of on why we chose to approach this topic. Um, as Peter mentioned, you know, um, a lot of students are coming towards the end of their studies, whether it's um, undergraduate, graduate, or just coming to the end of semesters. And we thought, um, you know, this topic of film education, uh, especially as it uh, differs and sometimes uh, intersects between uh, the United States and Germany, um, quite interesting because Germany and the United States, I think, are two countries that come to mind when you think of extensive history, countries with extensive histories that go back to the very beginning of film. I would say um, Germany and the United States are among those two countries that you would probably think of. Um, and so I would like to just give um, some shout outs to all of our yeah, um, panelists for giving their time and giving their expertise uh, and lending their perspectives to this conversation. So um, from the United States, and if you would like to wave or something, <laughs> whatever you wanna do, um, when I mention your name, feel free to do that. If you don't, no pressure. Um, so for the United States, I'm just going in alphabetical order. We have uh, Kyle David Crosby, who is a DC-based producer and production manager. He is an alumnus of George Mason University Film Studies program. Um, he has worked on numerous DC-based um, production sites, uh, film shooting sites, and he's also worked throughout the United States. He most recently uh, was in Montana working on a project. I don't know what the project was, but I think we'll find out eventually. Um, and um, he also, for instance, has worked um, with Comedy Central, HBO, and Netflix programs. Um, and so then our next um, 
panelist from the USA is Samuel George. He is a DC-based documentarian, filmmaker, and global markets and digital advisor at the Bertelsmann Foundation here in Washington. He's an alumnus of Johns Hopkins University program in advanced international studies, and I believe he is working on his PhD right now, also from Johns Hopkins. Um, and his most recent uh, released to my knowledge, I think was um, a documentary called Go Go City, which is about the history of go-go music uh, in Washington, DC, a very specific and beloved genre to DC. So definitely check that out if you're interested. Um, and our third panelist from the USA is Claudia Myers. Uh, she is a DC-based filmmaker and associate professor at American University School of Communications and co-head of the Art and Entertainment concentration program. She is an MFA alumna of Columbia University School of the Arts and Yale, and she is also a celebrated filmmaker who has been named in multiple publications um, a filmmaker to watch over her career. And so we continue to watch her. <laughs> uh, she's been doing a lot of great stuff. And so then from Germany, we have um, Clara Zoe Meilen von Arnim. Uh, she is a Berlin-based filmmaker and student of directing at the German Film and Television Academy of Berlin, uh, De FFB for short. Uh, she's also the director of numerous short films, including Rose Empire, which we showed in the last years at DC Shorts Festival and also at EuroAsia Shorts Festival. Um, and they have also been screened in festivals, uh, including the Internat Internationale Hofer Filmtage Film Festival in Bavaria. Um, we have Christoph Hochhäusler. He is a Berlin-based filmmaker whose films Falsche Bekenner um, in 2005 and Unter dir die Stadt from 2010. They both screened in their respective years under the Uncertain Regard section of the Cannes, the Cannes Film Festival. Um, he's the co-founder and co-publisher of Revolver Film Magazine, and he is the coordinator of the directing program at the DFFB. Um, he is an alumnus of the Berlin Technical University in Architecture and of the University of Television and Film School Munich, or the HF München. Um, then we have Sabrina Sarabi. She is a Berlin-based filmmaker whose debut film, Prelude, premiered at the Munich Film Festival in 2019. She is an alumna of Theater and Film Studies program at Utrecht University in the Netherlands and um, of the film program at the Academy of Media Arts Cologne. And she is currently working on her second film, which is an adaptation of the novel uh, Niemann is Biting Kelburn, which translates to Nobody is Watching the Calves. Um, so we look forward to that a lot, especially in the go to film world. Um, and then we have Hannah Weissenborn. Um, she's a Germany and France based filmmaker who has shot documentaries and shorts, including Am zu Sey, Mein ganzer Stolz, a, a short film which premiered and won several prizes at the Clermont Ferrand Short Film Festival 2019. And she is a student of film directing at the Film Academy Baden Württemberg in Ludwigsburg, which is in southern Germany, close to Stuttgart. So, um, Thank you and welcome to our panel. And we are so happy to have you all here. And thank you also to our um, to our attendees for joining in. And also a note to the attendees, um, if you have anything that you would like to ask our panelists, uh, the chat is open and the Q&A is open. And I'm gonna go ahead and say, I think I can hand it off to Pam. Does that sound good? Awesome, thank you, Raleigh. Um, just to set the, the stage for how we're going to proceed here, I've got some questions that I'm going to ask and I'll, I'll go around and I'll ask the individual people. Right now I'm going to start with the way I've written you down on, in my notes and then we'll just kind of bounce around um, based on the topic. For those of you who have questions in the audience, please put those in the chat. Um, Raleigh will be able to aggregate those and we will bounce back and forth between asking my questions to the panel and asking your questions to the panel. And so this is really going to be hopefully a conversation among all of us. So I, I wanna set this stage um, as far as defining the term. So we all kind of get on the same page as to what we're talking about. Film school, um, university, formal school. Um, we're talking about any formalized study of film um, and versus whether or not you went to a film school that calls itself a film school, whether you went to a university, um, whether you've taken seminars, whether you're self-taught. Um, so I'm gonna ask each of you to just start, did you go to a film school yourself? 
And for those of you who are teaching, please also tell us what kind of teaching? Are you teaching seminars, workshops? Are you teaching in a formal school? Are you teaching in a university setting? Um, to give you the example, I went to the University of Michigan undergraduate and I studied creative writing. Part of that study was screenplay, but there was nothing else with regard to film being studied at that time. So basically I only have formal training in screenplay. And bizarrely, the only thing I've ever taught was um, performing for the camera for um, a group of Im improv students. So I did not teach what I've studied. <laughs> um, so just asking you to all kind of go around and talk about what, what did you study, how did you study it, and what are you teaching? Oh, I forgot. And <laughs> Hannah, we'll start with you, please. Please unmute. Sorry. So um, I'm, uh, I studied the politics, social science and law in the beginning <laughs> and worked in the first time at assistant director during some years. And then I dropped into Film Academy Baden-Württemberg. And during this time, I also did some exchange to other film schools, but I'm, I'm still student of this, of Film Academy. Right okay. Uh, Sabrina, please. I studied at the University of Utrecht um, in the Netherlands and um, I did film, theater and television studies, uh, a bachelor program and um, after that I went to the Academy of Media Arts in Cologne and then I had the um, I cannot think about their English name, but um, it was directing the um, main field I studied in. And, um, and I'm not teaching yet anything. So um, it's, I think it's about seven years now that I finished from the academy in Cologne. Thank you. And Clara Zoe? You can just say Clara, it's fine. Oh, thank um, you. Um, yeah, I still study at the German Film and Television School where Christoph teaches. It's the first thing that I ever studied. I did not do anything else before, but I worked as an assistant director and I still do at the same time. So I have to say that, that like, studying directing does not have to do that much with being an AD, to be honest. So it's like two different jobs. <laughs> And Christoph, I had you next. Yes, I, I studied some architecture in Berlin and then I applied for the FFB actually and didn't get into it at the time. So I studied in Munich uh, at the film school there. And um, I've been teaching for a long time now, um, all over. I mean, even I had a stint in at Harvard, uh, visual and, and, and environmental studies. I, I, I taught there um, directing actors once. But anyway, um, since 2017, I'm um, what they call senior lecturer at DFFB, which is sort of professor, not really, but um, um, into this direction. And, and I'm teaching there, I'm, but mostly, most of my time is actually devoted to discussing students' works, um, be it in editing or editing scripts or discussing ideas um, and so on. And of course, I mean, I'm also involved in some of the planning and so on, yeah. Thank you. And Sam, I have you next. Hi, everybody. So, uh, you know, I have no traditional film training. I did a master's degree in international uh, politics and international economics, which I think gave uh, some advantages going into documentary filmmaking and a lot of disadvantages, you know, and it was uh, very much uh, self-taught. And I would say my number one school was the university of making mistakes, uh, very much <laughs> taught through making mistakes that drive me nuts at the time. And then I swear to God, I'll never make that mistake again, which I, to various degrees of success, subsequently achieve. And um, Claudia. 
Hi, yeah. So um, I I got an MFA uh, from Columbia University in the in the film school there as a writer director, and then I now teach at American University, where I'm a uh, I teach in the Film and Media Arts Division within American University School of Communication, and I teach screenwriting and directing. Okay, and last but obviously not least, Kyle. Hey there. So uh, I went to George Mason University and I did the five-year plan and uh, found my way to the media production and criticism. Um, I wouldn't say George Mason was a film school, at least not at the time. Um, mm -hmm. but they had a division where you could do that. And I knew that's what I wanted to do. And, you know, I, I probably learned more on my first day on my first set, uh, after school, but the foundation that I had from school was extremely helpful. And, uh, I'm a working line producer, production manager, producer, primarily features television, commercial, um, occasionally documentary. Um, and, uh, yeah. Kyle, you raise a really good point. I mean, when I was at the University of Michigan in the mid 90s, there wasn't really film school like what we would be talking about today. Um, a couple of students maybe had one of those huge camcorders and would walk around campus um, trying sure. to take videos, but it wasn't anything like, like what we are today. Um, and that brings us to the next question, which is how did the, the study of film develop um, over the course of your, your career since you st first started getting into film. And for those of you who are students of film history, historically, how did um, the study of film develop? And you can just kind of indicate to me um, if you wanna take the question, otherwise I will pick people. Um, terrific, Sabrina, you said that you'd been studying for quite a while. Um, what are your thoughts on how um, the study of film has developed over time? Mm, are you talking about the study of like directing or the more scientific studies? That's a great question, actually. Um, there's a lot of different aspects to there's there's writing, there's storytelling, there's producing, there's editing, there's directing. Um, do you have a sense of what did did film school develop along with technology or did it develop along with the, the desire to tell, tell visual stories? Um, you can interpret that question any way you want. Can you help me again? <laughs> Sorry, that's the question. Oh yeah, sure. Um, we're just looking to kind of talk about how the study of film developed over the course of time. I mean, at, at some point, people had access to technology that would allow them to make films in their backyard. Um, were those the people that were the first film students or were the first film students the people who invented filmmaking? Um, we're just looking to have a conversation. So anybody's opinion is, is good. Um, there's not like a right answer that I'm yeah. looking for uh, here. Um, I don't know how much I'm familiar with um, how, uh, I don't know if I can say how much it, uh, what, what happened in the development. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what I could say about like uh, my experience in studying that when I started out, out with studying, um, the programs were very long and you um, started with that feeling that you have a lot of time for everything. Mm -hmm. And, and um, during my studies that changed, um, I remember that I think I was in my eighth or ninth semester, which is the regular study time. Um, we got letters that we would have to finish within the next year, um, which was a great shock for everybody because um, we all had the expectation that we would stay there for a very long time. And um, I think this has also changed a little bit in Germany, I think with the beginning of the uh, millennial, I would say that um, the study periods become, I think, a little bit more efficient and shorter. Mm -hmm. um, do you, and do you think that's because of the way technology has developed? Um, I think it's more a society mm -hmm. um, aspect that, that the world would 
um, get a lot faster and things needed to get a lot more efficient. I think um, like also they changed the bachelor master system and before they had a longer running system in the universities as well. And um, I think it has more to do with the um, need to grow faster and um, less the technology. Claudia, what are you seeing within um, your, your teaching in the university setting? Are you seeing um, changes develop over time? Um, and if so, how do you account for them? I definitely see some changes happening both within the program that I joined. Um, you know, the, the particular program at American University was very heavy on documentary when I joined it. And, um, you know, part because we're in Washington, D.C. and there, you know, there are a lot of opportunities for documentary films and nonprofits and so forth. Um, and so I was brought in to kind of help expand the fiction side of it. So that's a change that was, you know, intentional and more about like rounding out the offerings of our program. But in terms of evolution of our program as a possible uh, uh, litmus for other, you know, what's happening more broadly is um, the expansion of different types of storytelling. We're seeing, um, you know, it's a we're at a, such an interesting moment in terms of distribution platforms and. Um, you know, the, the, the future of films writ large, uh, streaming services now becoming mm -hmm. like the new powerhouse studios. And, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I don't know, Netflix was this weird company where they sent out a bunch of red envelopes with DVDs in them. So, you know, things, mm -hmm. you know, we are seeing change in a very real way that affects what we do and how we teach. You know, television is now, you know, people are talking about it as another golden age that the, this emphasize on serialized storytelling, the the rebirth of you know the limited series, or maybe not rebirth, but there's just there's such an increased appetite for serialized content. I think COVID was <laughs> uh, helpful in terms of getting people as captive audiences. Um, but then also just in terms of technology, we have a uh, you know a gaming program, and we have faculty that are expanding uh, teaching into VR. Um, you know, uh, uh, AR, VR, augmented reality, virtual reality. We're now starting to develop a partnership with uh, studios overseas in terms of nonlinear storytelling and interactive forms of storytelling. So yeah, our program is definitely evolving to, to keep up with all these new ways of telling stories and figuring out, you know, um, how to harness them for the best, you know, for the best result. And I, I see Raleigh there. Do you wanna chime in? Sorry, I always have the delay with the muting. Um, I was just gonna, um, it was interesting because Sabrina, you mentioned the way that you've seen changes in um, sort of the expectation of how long you should take in, in film school in Germany. And I thought that that was a really interesting perspective because one thing that Pam and Peter and I were talking about, and I think maybe our American panelists might be able to uh, relate to, I mean, and even me as somebody who did not study film, but I studied other things over a six year period, you know, and I crammed bachelor and magister uh, and, and master studies into those six years, um, that there is, there does seem to be a very interesting sort of correlation between how in the United States you have to pay quite a lot of money mm -hmm. to go to school. And um, of course, if you're a person who does not come from much money, you of course have kind of a fire under your butt to get all of the stuff that you wanna get done in those years. Um, and then anything else that you would like to do, you better hope for just a fellowship or a scholarship if you don't wanna be paying loans for the rest of your life. And um, you know, on the other side that you know, in Germany, secondary education is much more you know, it, it's it's cheaper. It's not something that um, I don't think, I mean, and maybe this is something that I could be corrected on. I mean, I gladly, just that um, I see at least friends of mine in Berlin and friends of mine who, you know, go and they pursue a, a master's degree. They don't have that. It doesn't feel like they have that enormous, enormous pressure to get something done in two years or three years. So it is interesting that you mentioned there is still kind of like a 
an expectation that you get it done a little bit faster than even in the past. And so I would be curious just to know um, between our American panelists and our German panelists, uh, do you feel like there is a sense of um, in Germany, like there is a sense of, um, you know, you can take a little longer, um, even in comparison to in the past versus in the United States where, you know, because education is still seen as an invest, a financial investment here, um, you have to speed it up a little bit more. What do you all think? I see that Christoph has an answer there for you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it definitely is a di big difference. I mean, basically, it, um, universities are free in Germany, so you can study at DFB and have very little money. I mean, you, of course, you have to support yourself in some way, but you don't have to pay for the studies. Um, and as we are not integrated in the master bachelor system, DFB is, is a slow school in, in comparison to many other schools, which is a thing I would always defend because it gives people, yeah, well, um, the time they need. I mean, some of our students are super fast, but some of them take quite a while because, before they make their first um, um, graduation, I mean, their, their, their graduation projects. And, and I, I think overall, I mean, for some, it might be also a burden to not have someone to push you more. But overall, I think it's, it's an advantage, um, definitely. Uh, for example, if you look at the, the latest um, film by Alexander Kobarit, who was in competition with his graduation film, um, this is obviously a very um, mature filmmaker because he studied a long time. So, and we let him study. So this is, this is one point. I see that uh, Clara also has a response. I have, to, I have the feeling that this is also depends on if you can afford to study that long, but because I don't, I don't think that all the students who take so long to finish their studies are spending all the time till they finish uh, just having their head into studies. I think it's also because it takes time to uh, to finish film school, you have to have your graduation film and it takes time to fund it and then you are graduated, but it's not as if these people would be in seminars all the time. And then it's, I think it's also a question of if you have the possibility from home or somewhere else, if you can work just to afford to study that long or, or if at some point someone tells you, you have to start to earn money with it, otherwise, go and study law now or something. I mean, this is very important. I mean, and, and it's a big problem, I think, not only in German film, but if you look at the average German filmmaker, they all come from a relatively wealthy or super wealthy background. And for a big reason, of course, because just to make it, um, you know, to have this stamina to, to wait mm -hmm. until you get your chance to, make a long feature and a second feature of something, um, you need a lot of money. And this is- um, Definitely. I mean, I mean if, if I wouldn't have a scholar, sorry. Sorry. If, if I wouldn't have a scholarship and uh, and it's called BAföG, it's just something that you, you have uh, for your first time. If you, if you study the first time, you get money from the state. And if I wouldn't have that, I would also don't have the time just to study over years and years film to have my final big project because I would just not be able to afford that. So it's a luxury thing as well, I think. So one of the um, follow-up questions I wanna ask about that, I'm gonna shoot over to, to Sam and Kyle and get your point of view here. Um, we're talking about studying film, um, but that's a pretty huge category. I mean, there's technology, there's storytelling, there's producing, there's editing, there's um, how to use the editing software. There's editing theory, there's film theory, there's a study of historical. Um, if you could just advise the film students or the, the early stage film students, what would you tell them to focus on in their studies? I mean, other than the basic core curriculum of filmmaking, what, what do you think are the most important um, things that a filmmaker should be looking into? 
I was just going to pop in real quick and say, Kyle, I saw your hand go up in regard to the previous topic. So if you wanted to. Oh, yeah, you can <laughs> time all together. Yeah. Um, first off, I find it really inspiring and encouraging that it seems to me, and I could be wrong, that every other country invests in filmmakers, whether they be professionals or students. I just don't have that experience in the United States. Like when I think of when it comes to like the government having anything to do with filmmaking, it's just not a thing that really happens here aside from tax incentive programs for, hey, go to this state or that state mm -hmm. and we'll give you pennies back on the dollar to film your movie here. So when I watch films, uh, whether they come out of Germany or England or France, and it says, you know, the, the Ministry of Filmmaking supported the making of this movie, I always find that just intriguing. Um, you know, I, I think that Clara had a really good point. Uh, it costs a lot of money to make a movie, whether you raise it or you have it. And that takes time. And I've done that professionally and it takes time. It just takes time. And so if you can go to uh, a place where you can learn and hone a craft, uh, and raise money at the same time and afford to pay your bills, I think that's incredible. <laughs> I don't think that's the path for most. But I do think that's an incredible path if you find yourself fortunate enough to be on it. So to your point, um, to your question, Pam, of uh, what is the most important thing you can take away from film school? I mean, look, I, I don't come from a rich family. I don't come from a Hollywood family. Um, I, I learned a lot practically. I started as a production assistant. Um, and I had a friend open a door for me who wanted to get out of film and into music and I was in music and wanted to get out of music and into film. And uh, he got a call to work on a little PSA for a hospital system and he didn't want to do it. And he gave them my name and number. And I walked through that door and have been making, you know, connections and networking ever since. And that was, um, oh my God, 15, 16 years ago. And what is the most important thing you can learn? Networking. Networking is the most important thing you can learn. Um, I would also say that everybody wants, everybody thinks they want to direct and write. And, and I still entertain those same aspirations, but there are so many other things that you can do that are extremely fulfilling as a filmmaker. And I think something that's really important is to understand that that definition of filmmaker is not exclusive to directing and writing. Those things are the most visible. You know, I'm probably followed very closely behind, you know, cinematographer, but accountants are filmmakers, production managers are filmmakers, set decorators are filmmakers, grips and electrics are filmmakers. It is a big all encompassing term. And I know lots of people that have carved out fulfilling careers, not directing, not writing in filmmaking. And so I think there is something to that. that that's again, it's not to take away from or to like smash anybody's dreams about directing and writing. I mean, I, I wanna do those things as well. Um, but I also want to keep doing it. And sometimes even just the proximity and being adjacent to it is enough. It, it has been for me. It has, it has been something that I have found uh, fulfilling. So networking and recognizing that being a filmmaker, you are not a failed filmmaker if you don't direct or write. There are lots of things that you can do as a filmmaker. That is such a great point. Um, when I think about the creative team that I work with, the essential people that I have to work with from day number one, believe it or not, for me, it's my, my DP, mm -hmm. my editor, mm -hmm. and my composer. Okay, cool. Those, those are my top three that have a say in every single thing from concept to completed project. Um, I have the composer walking through potential locations with me because he might hear things that I don't hear I like in, in the set. Um, my editor is there from day one because she's going to be the, the shaper of the story. Um, you know, the old adage, shoot the film you want, um, write the film you want, shoot the film you can, edit the film you've got. There you go. um, and, and that's her job um, is to edit that film. So I, I think it is important to lift up all the other players um, in this field as important filmmakers. I, I would have gotten nothing done if I didn't have a composer that 
that I trusted, an editor that I trusted, and a DP that I don't have to figure out how to shoot this thing, he will. Right. Um, so Sam, I'm gonna just kind of bounce back to you for your advice. You are a self-made filmmaker. You went to the school of what not to do. So shortcut it for us. Give us some, yeah. some helpful tips. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, first of all, I think for folks out there, what you heard Kyle say and what you said some of the folks say before that, take that to heart because they're really coming with the experience on the inside. And I, I just wanna jump on that idea of networking because when I think about what are some of the many things that I missed out on because I wouldn't, I didn't have the opportunity to go to film school, I think to build that network, you know, other people that are going to be out there getting into this, doing work are just a fantastic resource that can reverberate for years and years down the road. And I would just, I don't know how it is in film school, but I know in my IR school, you know, people be, could be kind of competitive, you know, and people could be kind of like eyeballing each other who's going to get the better position first. And um, I, hopefully that doesn't exist as much in film school, but it's not helping anybody. So like try to, uh, you know, and, and, and I think sort of um, a, a, a side of that is the faculty is such an important resource to take advantage. You know, when I, who I work by myself, at an institution that doesn't do a lot of other filmmaking stuff. When I am able to, at a festival, be around other filmmakers, or sometimes a documentary filmmaker will come through that has a whole lot of experience and talent, I will shamelessly pick their brain to the point of saying, this is gonna be annoying, but all those things that, the practical things, how do you back up your files at night when you're in a developing country and you can't put it on the internet? What f-stop do you like to use when you're running and gun? I'll sit there and just ping them. And if you have access to faculty like that, take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. um, the best advice I can give is get your hands on the equipment as much as possible. Just do it because that's how I mean that's how I learned, and it's and you primarily learn by making mistakes. Again, that I really wasn't joking when I said that before. The more mistakes you get out of the way, the more you learn how to do it right and then also you start seeing when you watch tv you say oh that's how they did that and then you incorporate that the next time you come through and then that becomes another teacher and then if i could wax poetic i think the last thing i would say is just try to remember why you love doing this because this is an experience that will kick you in the stomach yeah. as hard as it can and it hurts and you feel like you're not any good at this and you were you weren't you weren't you if you get too caught up in trying to be the next this or the next that or make this or make that it can be a very disillusioning experience and when i come against that disillusionment i try to get back at why do i love this i love this because this is a beautiful art form to share stories and connect things and people it's not about being this or winning that so that is what I have to say. Can I'm I, gonna pull, what's that? Sorry, Pip, can I piggyback onto something Sam said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, you should PA. Everyone should be a production assistant. Um, you don't have to do it forever. I mean, I did it for years, uh, but especially if you get to PA on a non-union project, like I said, that first job I did, I literally asked every single department had a question and I'm sure I annoyed them, but they were so gracious, you know, talking to the gaffer, the key grip, the art director, you know, hey, what's this, what's that? And, and on a, on a non-union set, you are oftentimes afforded opportunities to help in a way that sometimes on union sets, you know, certain people are allowed to touch certain things and, and certain people are not. But when you get some practical hands-on production assistant experience, you get to kind of dabble and see what it is that grabs you. So I just wanted to to you know, reinforce what Sam was saying, learn, ask questions, um, but, but practical experience like that is invaluable. And uh, I've been really fortunate to, to have students on num numerous sets that I've done, had uh, produced. And to me, that, that is a, an experience that translates to them opening further doors for themselves down the road. Do you mind if I, I ask the question? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, 
I thought about it because of what Kyle especially mentioned about, you know, um, the idea that filmmakers, you know, well, one, his point about how filmmakers, you know, can involve literally everybody who is working on a film set. And then secondly, you know, this idea of um, government funding and funding that comes from, you know, um, uh, foundations that are set up specifically to fund the arts. And so my question actually um, was was directed towards Hannah and Clara, because you guys are still um, st uh, students at film schools. Uh, but also, I think maybe Christoph and Sabrina, you also, uh, as ex you know, ex having had experience as students at film schools, perhaps might also have thoughts on this. But um, Clara and, and, and Hannah, your films were two of the first short films that I remember watching when I started to do film programming at Goethe. And I remember being blown away, found out that you were students because in the United States, the idea of a student film, I think sometimes is very different. Um, it's, it's still very, um, I don't wanna say, it's still a little bit DIY. It's still on a little bit on a DIY level. And the films that you guys made were so polished. And I remember the credits rolling and seeing all the people that were involved in your films. Um, for instance, with Hannah, you had to work with a whole cast of people who spoke Romanian. So Romanian speaking um, actors and, and Russian speaking actors. And so you had to work with casting people and all of these people coming together. And I was just wondering in a German film school, um, setting when you're making these films, um, how much of that, um, again, I guess maybe coming around to networking or just the way that the school is structured, how much of that is something that you have to coordinate yourself versus something that the school is able to assist you with, if that makes sense? So in my case, I can only say that I was especially lucky because for me, it was my, only my second year film. And I think I only got to this film because I took a gap year after my first year of Film Academy, actually. And I did a guest semester in the um, School of Media Arts in Cologne. And there I just visited some, some courses for getting, getting more information, like learning more about film, but I didn't have film school specifically. So I used all this year for doing research and for preparing this film. And usually in film school, you have to do in, in, in film academy, we have a very tight schedule. And because I took this year for myself to do a one year research in the tracker world and to get to know all these people, um, because it was a half documentary film like there was a lot of people I who were real truck driver and who I met and then I included in the film um I think I only could do this because I had so much time in prepare like for a second year film a lot of time and because the school our school did give me this time because they saw it was necessary and I argumented it and so in this case, it's a freedom they give to us, but not that they tell to everyone, do this now, yeah. Um, first, thanks. thanks that you say polished. I don't know if it's a compliment, but um, I, I think- it, it was supposed to be. <laughs> It's one of the advantages when you study at film school is that um, of course you get some money from the school to make those films. Rose Empire was my second year film as well. Then you have the advantages that you have the technical equipment. So you have the, the cameras that you will use later on anyways. And on the DFFB, um, the second year film goes through the same post-production as every feature film afterwards. So you have a grading and stuff and you don't have to pay for that. I don't know how it is in the um, um, uh, in, in other countries, but with us, so the, the process is quite professional and the school funds for it. So this is why it has the professional look. And then on Rose Empire, the special thing was that I actually worked as a PA for a long time before, and I just had the great connections outside of the film school. So I worked as a PA for 
for Snowden. And then our AD, my AD worked before on several big projects. So he knew how to make a shot list and st like on a breakdown and stuff. So this was an advantage that I had. So it was the combination, I think, of film school and being able to work outside of film school and then the combination of this networks. Hannah, you had a follow up? Yeah, I just want to add something. Uh, what Clara said that I completely agree that the kind of professional look, uh, let's call it polish, is uh, completely a thing of special film schools um, that are so divided in so many departments that we arrive and we can can have all these facilities actually, yeah. Okay. I'm going to move to a more philosophical question, um, but for those of you who are listening, if you're put in your questions, because um, we're going to have Raleigh take a couple of your questions to the panel. Um, so while I'm doing this little philosophical Q&A, please get your questions in so um, Raleigh can kind of gather them. Um, and when I talk about philosophical, I just want to kind of change to, there's the influence that life and society has on film and there's influence that film and society has on um that film has on society so there's kind of it goes both ways the the politics the this the social history um uh what was i gonna say i have, <laughs> I have to go back to my notes here um the the cultural the social the historical um Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, how much of, and, and this is gonna be different for everybody because it could be locational, it could be generational, um, but where do you see the outside factors of history, politics, society influencing your filmmaking? And in what ways do you hope to use your filmmaking to influence the culture or the society um, or the politics? And Sam, with your, big old master's degrees and all this stuff, would you start us off? Yeah, well, that definitely fits into what I'm trying to do because, you know, these documentary films, again, I work for the Bertelsmann Foundation, so we're very interested in the way I describe it as the interaction between uh, politics, economics, and social issues. So we're very much driven about trying to capture those moments. And I mean, I think that, you know, what I try to do with these sort of observational documentaries is um, try to expose people to what they haven't seen before and you know try to walk people so that they can make the conclusions on their by by themselves i think because um i think when you tell people what to think they react really negatively to it but if you can show somebody something and get them to think that they've thought of it themselves then you may actually change how somebody thinks um, so um, that's that's what we try to do is, is try to try to give like an honest representation and and hope that it leads people into the ballpark of the kind of conclusion that we're trying to make. And again, I mean that, that's a, that's a kind of beauty of visual arts that it can do something like that. It can somebody can watch it and think that they just figured it out by themselves, and it's a very very powerful impact. I'm going to ask Claudia and Christoph, um, what kinds of of advice or, or discussions you have with students about this, um, either about them being influenced by their society or by their culture, or them attempting to influence their society or their culture? Um, I guess I can start. Um, uh, that's a really important question, actually. And I think um, one of the things that made me want to teach at American was that uh, the program has a stated emphasis on you know media that matters. So, um, you know, my concentration, the fiction portion of our program is called art and entertainment. In other words, entertainment is great that, you know, there, there is no higher or lower art form in, in terms of how we approach filmmaking, but we do feel that there's a lot of power in filmmaking and the way we tell stories. And we need to be conscious of what we're putting out into the world and take responsibility for it. So, um, that's one thing that I tell my students is take responsibility for what you put out there, know what you're saying, know why you're saying it, know why you're the best person to say it, not just because it will make you a better artist, but because it's also a better chance you'll get somebody to let you direct that film if you can make a strong case for why it's your story to tell. Um, 
And so it's not so much, you know, I think we all um, are sensitive to different aspects of, of, you know, the world around us. We all have different things to say. We all have different perspectives to share. Um, you know, our program in particular has a big focus on it, it, it at the moment, especially, um, you know, on diversity and inclusion and, and telling stories of, uh, you know, voices that haven't been heard, characters that haven't been seen. Um, but really it's, it's stories that matter in whatever, whatever that means to the filmmaker. And there's no, um, again, there's, there's no better or worse, but I do think um, it's a medium that is really designed for an audience. And it's also a medium that cannot be done in isolation. You know, you don't write a script and then you're done. You write the script and you're just beginning, apart from the fact that you rewrite the script about 50 times before you get to production. Um, it really is an act of collaboration. So the other thing that we emphasize is really um, clarifying and, and uh, you know, your intent, clarifying your vision, clarifying the meaning of the story as it, you know, as it makes sense to you and, and sort of thinking about what you're trying to say. Uh, what about you, Krista? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think any, any, any piece of art is in a way um, a time piece telling you what's, what's happening, you know? And in that respect, while I totally agree with Claudia, I think you can't escape it. I mean, even if you don't want to make a film about your time, you will. Mm -hmm. And the more important thing is, can you have the, can you develop the intensity and also maybe humility to, to be this vessel to actually um, register the time appropriately, you know? And and this is something that is very very different from every, from from for every artist. So it's very difficult to actually give advice on that other than than make people think about it and also make people trust their instinct, which is the same thing, but different, you know. And 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 craft uh, and, and, and learning how to do it is something that you really can do outside by making films. Mm -hmm. But to have time to realize um, what instrument you are, so to speak, that's something that that is, you, for many people, film schools are a good place to, to explore that question, I think. Is it okay if I jump in with a quick question? Oh, absolutely, that? yeah. Um, because I was thinking of um, the, I was just in listening to the responses, I thought about um, actually maybe this is something that that Kyle and actually maybe Sabrina might have thoughts on. Um, because Sabrina, you just had your debut um, feature film in 2019 with Prelude, which I think if anybody who's watching or hasn't seen it, it's a really great movie. And you're currently working on your next feature film. And um, so you have, um, you know, you finished film school and now you are working uh, with feature films. I mean, which of course means you may go back to any kind of films, but you're working on feature films right now. And um, is there anything that you remember learning from your film school experience that um, in this time as you're making the works that you make, that, that you carry with you? If that makes sense. Um, I think that I learn with every film. So um, I can say that from like Prelude to my next film now, um, with Prelude, I, for example, I worked a lot on the script before we shot, which was also because the um, financing took a lot longer than with my second film. Um, that was one reason, but also I had um, the feeling that um, with my feature film, my first one, I worked so much on the script that there was so much in my own head and it took too long to share it with others. Um, and I changed this a lot with my second film. I um, had a very long observation period, but I think it was only my third uh, version of the script when we started in the preparations in the summer because I wanted to have more influence on all the filmmakers like the filmmakers in the process like the um, camera 
and the um, set design and my actors. So we developed a lot um, this summer together. And um, so I think that I took this from like working on the short films and then making my first feature and now the second one that it's like a conclusion um, of um, several works, I would say. Um, and also, yeah, um, I think I, um, I also got pregnant while I was working on a second feature. So that was um, some, I, I took a lot of time off working on the movie, which felt very good for my movie. Um, like I, I spent a lot of more time on my first feature and sometimes um, when I was pregnant, I um, did a lot of other things. I also lived with my grandma for a very long time during that process. Um, and I, I spent a lot of time with other things while this was working in my back head. Um, which was, uh, um, yeah, was still is a very nice experience for me because, um, yeah, I, I really enjoy making this movie at the moment. It's interesting because, you know, it's sort of connecting with what, you know, what Kyle has mentioned about, you know, when you were saying this was 16 years ago or something that you started to really uh, work your way through you, you know, your path to where you are now, you know, it, there seems to be between what everybody's been talking about, like sort of a theme of, or an ongoing theme of, you know, time, <laughs> it takes time, you know, it takes patience. And I don't know, Pam, I didn't mean to, um, <laughs> to sort of derail anything you were thinking, but um, no. yeah, um, that was just kind of a thought that I had about just the lessons, you know, seems like a, an interesting common lesson that seems to be coming out of a lot of what I hear is, is, is yeah, just, uh, I, I don't really like this term that everybody throws around right now where they're just like, trust the process. But, you know, there is very, very that, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah, I was just trying to kind of get into a little philosophical, a little loftier of a, of a um, debate just, to, just to, to vary it up so they don't say that all we do is talk about technical filmmaking things, um, but we talk about culture and history and art um, as well as, as the technical. Um, so do you wanna grab a few questions from the audience? Do you have anything that's uh, coming up? Yeah, so we have two questions. Um, one is from Mohammed, um, and he has asked the question, are there any people of color who are directors of short films in Germany? If yes, can you share their names and what films did they make? So for our panelists uh, from Germany, I'm sure that, um, I mean, at least as a programmer from Goethe, I can say absolutely. In fact, two people who have um, backgrounds that are beyond German are on our panel today. And so we do have, um, a whole mixture of, um, you know, people that at least as, as a Goethe programmer that we draw from when it comes to feature films, when it comes to short films, documentaries, everything. But if anybody would like to weigh in perhaps from Germany on just the diversity of uh, filmmaking um, in Germany, feel free to contribute anything you'd like. <laughs> I'll give you guys some. Uh, sorry. No, please go. I wouldn't know where, where to start because he specifically asked for short films. And I think that when I think about our film school and all the filmmakers that we have, I think there are a lot of people of colors who make short films. It would be, if he's still listening, then more interesting what kind of short films he's looking for. And then to think about what director. Because otherwise, it, this is uh, it's, it's a bit big. It's a big range. Is is he looking for Asian filmmakers? Is he looking for black filmmakers in Germany? What kind of short films? Because there are a lot. And um, oh, and Christoph, you had something that you wanted to contribute. Yes, I I, I think that it's actually quite divided uh, for the moment because our film schools are s s very diverse especially where I teach, where Clara studies, it's a, it's a very international school. It's very hard to say, are these films German films? 
who knows, you know, I mean, they're made in the film school by students of ours. But when it comes to, to the German film industry overall, the diversity is much, much um, less developed, uh, let's say. Um, and, and of course, I mean, there are obviously there are very talented uh, filmmakers that you could call people of color, which is an expression that um, is not super popular yet in Germany, I guess. But um, there are other people who would identify with it. Um, but it's 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 it's, uh, it's it's more lacking. I mean, there's a there's clearly a representational problem in in the German film industry in that respect. And and right now there's a lot of debate about this, which I think is a good thing. And um, one other question that we have from Jana, she says, question from a German film student. In Germany, sometimes a diploma from a public film school feels like. Uh, it says STMP, maybe it's stamp, something to break the glass ceiling into the industry. Is it the same in the US? How do you perceive this kind of quality check by just getting into a certain school? Does anybody want to take that on? I'll, I'll, I'll give a perspective. Sure. Um, you know, I, I, think, <laughs> I think film school is great. And it's important. I think what's more important is what you bring to the table. And, and film school can help you bring tools to the table. But at the end of the day, it's whether or not you can deliver. At least when you're talking just like Ooh. practically, you got hired to do a job. Did you do that job? Right. And, you know, for me as a line producer, I, I very rarely look at whether or not someone went to film school. I more often look at how did I find this person's name? Who told me about this person? Do I trust that person? You know, that's word of mouth and your reputation as a, as a craftsperson, artisan, you know, whatever the right descriptor is, is so critical. Um, and can a film degree open doors? I think it can. I, I think it really depends on where you went to school and what you studied and what you're applying for, right? Like, I don't know of an assistant director school. <laughs> I've never, I don't know what film school there is you go to learn how to be an AD because, and, and Clara would probably agree, you, you learn how to be an AD from other ADs, right? And, and most ADs are working on set. They're not necessarily teaching a class of how to do that sort of thing. Not to say that couldn't happen. I've just never experienced it. And the flip side of that coin is cinematography. When I engage with cinematographers that maybe went to AFI or USC, I, I definitely think a little bit differently about them, right? Like, oh, okay, they actually went and studied cinematography at a school that has a track record of churning out cinematographers. So I think it's, I think it's a little bit, it, it really depends on the situation. Like what, what is the role that person's coming to interview for, right? And, and how does the perception, right or wrong, of going to school for that role play into whether or not it even matters? I don't mean that, I'm not in any way trying to sound disparaging. Raleigh, I know we talked about my perspective on school versus practical, you know, what I got out of it and what I got out of just working. Um, but I, I think that a lot of the industry is that way. I, the, the, the US film industry, you know, you're looking at track record, you're looking at, even if you don't have a track record, who referred you? Where did your name come from? You know, and, and that goes a long way. Go ahead, Raleigh, did you have a follow-up? I see Claudia's hand up, so I'm gonna go ahead and say, Claudia, did you wanna to add to that point? And then we're gonna to go to one other question that we have. Sure, no, I just wanted to say that um, I, I I agree that um, in the end, as prestigious as your school may be, or as you know, if you're going to a program that no one's ever heard of, if you, again, depends on the role you're you're positioning yourself for. But if you want to be a director and you have a tremendous short film, nobody cares where you went to school, right? 
if you have a film that is knocking people's socks off and is making waves and is earning awards or is placing in festivals, I don't think anybody's going to even care. Um, so it's really about, you know, what did you go to film school to learn? And ultimately, what can you, you know, what can you create? If you're a screenwriter, how good is your script? Um, how, how unique of a voice do you have? It's always the, I mean, that's going to matter a lot more. Sure, you might get better positioned for certain internships if you have a really powerful alumni network. And there are certain things that kind of marquee name film schools can offer you. I'm talking about the US, I'm not comparing to Germany because I can't speak to that. Um, but in terms of if you, if you have gone to film school to be a creator of film, whether it's an editor, a DP, a, you know, a, a, a screenwriter or a director or producer, et cetera, uh, or a composer, it's, it's gonna be, it's your music, it's your film, it's your script, that's what's gonna distinguish you. And so I, I think film school is great. And certainly there are some schools that have really powerful networks that really support their students with like massive, like their films. There's a lot of funding for student films. There are a lot of kind of bells and whistles, but nothing is a replacement for like content and quality. So just wanted to say that. Great. And, you know, we have um, a couple of questions in the Q&A, but I'm just going to take one because of time. So thank you so much to everybody who has submitted questions in the Q&A and in the chat. Um, and just to sort of one more question before I guess we can wrap up and we have uh, an attendee who has asked, as a current film student who is also Black, trans, low income, and immigrant, I'm struggling to balance how much energy to put into systemic change at my school and time to invest in learning filmmaking as a craft. How is your school implementing lessons from hashtag me too and hashtag Black Lives Matter within your curriculum? And I think that this is interesting question because it sort of goes back also to what we were talking about, about storytelling and filmmaking in general and, and what everybody's working on right now and how they're sort of bringing, whether they intend to do it or not, that kind of the stuff that's going on right now into what they're working on. Um, but Claudia and Christoph, as faculty members um, at film schools, perhaps you might have things to say about this. Um, or everybody else as people who have Sam having worked with Bertelsmann or um, everybody else having been at some point a film student. Uh, if you all have any thoughts, please feel free to jump in too. Um, I, can, I can take a crack at it since I'm unmuted. Um, uh, I want to say that, um, you know, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, at American University, there is a, a really um, deliberate focus on increasing, you know, uh, equity and diversity and inclusion. And, um, you know, as a faculty member, uh, yes, we are having conversations about how to make our curriculums um, more inclusive. You know, film, uh, you know, even just the way film history is taught. Uh, you know, how, how can we kind of expand the lens through which we look at film history? How can we, you know, uh, uh, expand our perspective to make it more global? Um, so there's a, there's a really deliberate um, effort to have, you know, faculty be very mindful of like, which, you know, from the which scripts do we read in screenwriting class to which films do we study in film theory to which guest speakers do we bring in? There's a, there's an awareness, which is, you know, I'm sorry to say, but like still relatively new and we can do a lot better. Um, but I will say that it is, that it is, it, it is pretty much at the forefront and, and AU, um, I think is really committed. And I think the faculty is really committed, but we're not perfect. And, um, and I would just say to the person that posed the question, who feels like they're trying to figure out, you know, how much to kind of influence change at their school and, and how much to focus on, on their studies, that sounds like that's a really kind of tough and stressful position to be in. And, um, you know, clearly they need to, you know, you should be looking at what's going to make you the best filmmaker you can be. This is a limited period of time. You have to develop your craft. So I would say, um, you know, pushing change ahead is is important, but you also need to make sure you're not taking away from what you really came there to do. So with that more context, I can't say much more, but I, I just, it sounds like it's a, it's a difficult position and hopefully 
there are sympathetic faculty who can kind of pick up the, you know, pick up the, the momentum and, um, and, and people that you can go to. to it, it really has to come from the institution itself. The students can, can sort of jumpstart it, but there needs to be a, a receptivity to change. So I hope that's the case. So we're getting ready. To, oh, did you want to take that question, Christoph? Yeah, just one little thing. I, I know this might not be a popular position, but when I was studying in Munich, we, we hated the school. And this hate actually created a lot of things, good things. And, and what I'm trying to say is to find the institution lacking is obviously um, a, a challenge. Yeah, yes, of course, we, we, we have to try to make them better. But um, to have a resistance to know that this is wrong is also uh, power. Uh, you, can, you can use making films. And I mean, at least from my experience, of course, I'm, I'm in a very different position probably. But in my experience, um, this was an in, in, in incredibly important power, this being against certain structures. And, and I mean, at the time, it was really a very sexist place, for example. And it helped me in a way, you know, to, to know what's right and wrong. So um, I don't think any institution will ever be perfect. And maybe it's, it's good this way. <laughs> I'm not saying, of course, that that um, we we shouldn't change. Obviously, there, there there must be change. There's always change, and there's a lot to be accomplished. But um, it's it's um, to 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 be able to withstand this kind of um, bad environment is actually a very good. Um, exercise for for later because this will be the same thing all over i mean you you won't have the the, the perfect circumstances and then start making the good films you will make the good films fighting basically oh, yeah. that's my opinion so we're going to do a little wrap up um, my last quick wrap up question i'm just going to have everybody go because this is a german american partnership so i'm going to ask you for the german filmmakers What's one takeaway that you would like the Americans in the audience to take away um, from what filmmaking is like in Germany? And for the Americans, the same thing to the, the German students who are in the audience, what's something that you would like them to take away about um, American filmmaking? And I'm just gonna go around with uh, Hannah. Unmute, please. So to understand right the question, to, to say what is about German filmmaking? Yes, that you would like to have American students know about German filmmaking or German film school. Okay, I think the thing that I can tell them is that German film schools are very different. <laughs> like every everyone is really differently because it's a federal system and we have a lot of them and well, that's Thank what you. I can give for now. <laughs> Sabrina? Oh, sorry, I didn't find the unmute button. Um, yeah, I have to say I agree a little bit with Hannah because we had this earlier about um, also how long you can study and then you can take your time. Like Hannah has had a similar school experience um, where they have a very tight schedule and um, I think um, like the DFFB in Berlin is very different. Um, and I have many friends there who used to study there who really had a lot of time, which I very much admired that um, there was so much time for them to, um, yeah, because uh, what Clara said earlier that um, I think it's important to have that time and you do other things in between and um, you have the time to grow while you make your films. Um, but yeah, like um, I also think that there's no one German film school. Thank you. Clara? 
No, I, I don't know how to, how to answer that question, actually. Really, I don't, because there are so many individual ways how to approach film and filmmaking. So mm -hmm. there's, uh, no. Um, but I'm very excited to hear what Christoph says. Well, good, because Christoph is next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'd say the grass is always greener on the other side of the street. So from our perspective, the yes, of course, is is so amazing because so many interesting films are being made and, and the industry, the level of craft there is, of course, stunning. And also this kind of entrepreneurship that what Kyle is talking about, this is actually very inspiring for me because, yes, we are in a very privileged situation that we can study film for free and so on and make films and the state gives us money. But it's also a, a, a very slow and bureaucratic system at times. And, and I don't know many German filmmakers who are happy with the situation. So, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a two-sided sword. Um, mm -hmm. And we are all very, um, very much into US cinema still and as, a, as, as something, also some, sometimes as something to be against, which is also a very powerful force. And, and so I'm very grateful that, that for the, for the hands-on tradition of, of American filmmaking. I'm not, of course, um, saying that there's not, not no, no good film schools in, in, in the US. I know that there are fantastic film schools, but it seems to have not the same um, overall importance for the system, which I think could also be a good thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's two-sided. And Sam, what, what, did, what takeaway do you have for the German students? What would you like them to, to come away with? Yeah, I have to say I'm a little bit with Clara on this one. It's a, it's a tough, it, it's a sort of an individualistic uh, question. Um, and I think Christoph makes a good point about the, the grass is always greener. Um, I can definitely say that I have a very strong respect for both the tradition of European cinema and also the current uh, European cinema, the dedication to it as an art and not as, you know, a means to print money um, is, is, is laudable, you know, I mean, and it's, it, in some ways it can seem like a different approach. And I just, I just really genuinely appreciate the artistry that goes behind it. And it's, it's something that, frankly, I hope to live up to with what I do. And Claudia? Um. Yeah, I'm going to piggyback on what Christoph said and say the grass is always greener. You know, the 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 financial burden of film school in the U.S. is really unfortunate. I, I have to say, you know, um, and uh, and I wish it weren't. Uh, I wish there was a, a a sort of a public version of it that where we could support filmmakers. I wish our program had more money to support filmmakers. Um, uh, so I do think that's a major difference. Um, I would like to think that, um, you know, I can speak best to the program I'm in because of course I've been in it for a while, but I would, I, and I, it would be more of a question which we don't have time to answer, but I'll put it out there as a question, which is, you know, one of the things that I think students get in film school, one is to, in the U.S., is that you do, you do take time to like hone your craft and develop your voice and figure out what you have to say. Um, but you also find incredible mentors uh, in certain programs. Certain programs are really not big on mentoring their students. We're one that is. And, um, you know, the, the relationships that form between, you know, the professors and, and the students who then go on to work on their projects. And there's a lot of um, kind of integration of our professional and our uh, academic work. Um, all the faculty in American are also working professionals. And so I um, again, I would have loved to know if that was the, the same in Germany, but that is something that um, is, is, is very much a part of the film school experience in certain programs, which I think is a real benefit. It's, it's perhaps different and the classes are smaller, so I don't know, but I will leave it at that. All right, Kyle, it's up to you. Bring us on home. Oh man, no pressure. <laughs> None at all. Um, you know, I, I think the the benefit to studying in any scenario is that it's, you're going to build a foundation, right? Um, but the economics 
are inextricable from filmmaking. Uh, art for art's sake is lovely and wonderful and very few people can actually afford to do that. Um, I mean, very, 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 very few people can just do art because they want to do art and there is no burden of, of an economic. Um, and I think that is both, it is what it is. I was going to say it's good and bad, but it's just, it is what it is. Like, so at the end of the day, um, what do I want German students to take away from, but from, from this panel? <laughs> uh, follow your dream, follow your heart, um, but be open to the fact that the dreams can change and they can evolve and find a way to do what you want to do and not have to do anything else. And I don't mean like find a, find a benefactor. I, I, I mean, find a way to both be fulfilled by what you do and compensated. It is absolutely possible. Almost everyone I work with has done that. Everybody complains about their job. I complain about my job. The director complains about their job. The PA complains about their job. To some extent, everyone has a little bit of a gripe. But at the end of the day, what I tell myself every day is I'm getting paid to tell people stories and make pretty pictures. And I don't take it for granted. I am so appreciative of it. I've met so many incredible people doing this. I hope I get to do it until I can't breathe anymore. Um, but I, I would not be surprised if, if today was my last day. I, it, it can be so fleeting. It can be so, you know, so you just have to take every day as like, okay, I got to do this again. <laughs> the universe allowed me to do this again. And I'm just gonna keep doing it to the best of my ability. And, you know, some jobs I'm gonna enjoy more than others. And I know I'm speaking from a much more practical perspective versus like, I wanna make this script that I wrote. And I've had the opportunity to help filmmakers do that. Um, but I also know that that is a long, arduous journey. And um, you gotta find ways to support it. So the takeaway is glean everything you can from school build that foundation, develop those relationships, but, but look for those opportunities that can help you, that can help support those things. And, and also pass it on because you never know who you're helping the way they might help you later down the road, just by virtue of you helping them. And they remember, oh yeah, I totally remember when that person, you know, passed a job on to me and, and now I can return the favor. Thank you so much. And thank you to all our panelists. Um, we have gone a little bit over, so thank you all for, for the generosity of your time. Um, and I'll hand it off to you, Raleigh, if you have any final comments. Yeah, I just was gonna just add one last little thing because having come from, you know, I mean, my background is not in film, although I do film programming at Goethe, you know, and uh, my background, you know, like I said, those six years that I crammed in all of my studies was English literature and Germanistic, you know, so, um, you know, at the end of my, mat, uh, my MA studies, I remember thinking, do I want to go on to PhD level. I could have just very easily jumped from MA to PhD level, but I remembered thinking, how about you try some practical application of what you've been learning for the last six years? And that was what was a really essential factor in making me decide to go in and take my job at, at Goethe, which um, is where I have been able to put into action a lot of the things that I've learned over the last six years you know and um i think it's very easy at least in my academic bubble you know to have been able to go on to phd and to be able to go on to being a professor and to never really have put into action what i was learning all of these years and you know that old adage the those that can't do teach which i find very interesting here because we have two people who are teachers here who have done and are teaching and that idea of you learn and then you go and you do and then you come back and you teach and that whole sort of exchange between going from education to practical application and having all of that under your belt coming back and wanting to teach again and you know it was it's it was very inspiring to hear from people who were from a completely different background from from my educational background you know um you know kind of having that it seems to be there's a tying together factor of yeah you guys have all 
learned something and now it's like you guys are actually going out and doing it and some of you have been doing it and you've come back and you're teaching and you're going back out and making films and I think that's just a really great sort of way to go about something that's as intangible as the arts and the humanities because I think a lot of people tend to brush it off like you can learn and learn and learn and learn but you never really put it to action and I think a lot of these great people in this panel are really a great testament to how you can put it in action and then come back and teach people um so yeah just thank you all so much thank you to Kyle and Sabrina Clara Christoph, Sam, Hannah, and Claudia for all of your perspectives. It was really great to listen to you all and talk with you all. It's been, been very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. And also thank you, of yeah. course, to the attendees who have joined us. Um, I know that, you know, um, usually after the 530 point, we tend to have a drop off, but thank you to everybody who has stuck around. We're really appreciative that you all tuned in and stuck around for however long that you could or were interested in. We um, are recording this, so if you would like to stay tuned um, for when this is available through DC Shorts or go to Washington, um, you can go ahead and pass the link on to any friends who might want to watch the pre-recorded version. Um, and um, yeah, from the Goethe Institute and um, also from DC Shorts, although Pam, if you want to say anything, or Peter, I think Peter's uh, behind his screen now, but um, if you guys would uh, like to say anything, but thank you so much for, for this. This has been wonderful. And I know that uh, also in the world of Zoom fatigue, sometimes you never know exactly how a panel's gonna go, but um, I'm really happy that we've been able to do this with you all. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, thank you so much to Goethe. I think we've had a great collaboration um, and I'm really glad that that's going to continue. So uh, thanks everybody. You're all free to go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so Bye much. everybody. Thank you so much. Have a Bye. good night. Bye. Bye.